We're continuing our Advent series, Heaven Come Down, and we're going to be starting in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64, we're going to be looking, uh, starting in verse 1 there. If you, you, you can do a couple of different things. You can follow along with the screen. We'll have the Bible verses uh, put up there. Or if you need a Bible, there is a Bible that is in front of, our, in front of you and the chairs in front of you. Uh, it's an ESV version. That's what I'm going to be reading out of today. And if you don't have a Bible, we hope that that will be a, a gift that you can take home and, and use as a Bible reading plan and everything because we want you to have everything you need to, to encounter and uh, to engage with the Word of God. So, we're going to be starting Isaiah 64, verses one, verse 1. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. As when a fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries and that the nations might tremble at your presence. We, when you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence from of old. No one has heard or perceived by the ear. No one has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. You meet him who joyfully works righteousness. Those who remember you in your ways. Behold, you were angry and we sinned. And in our sins we have, uh, we have been a long time. And shall we be saved? We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Be not so terribly angry, O Lord, and remember not iniquity forever. Behold, please look, we are all your people. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. God, we open our hearts and minds to receive from you today. Let your words sink deep into our hearts, change us and form us. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Most of you remember, uh, how could you not remember, unless you just weren't born, uh, a few years ago we had this little thing called COVID. Oh, you some of y'all remember it? Okay, good. <laughs> Making sure that that wasn't like a niche experience for me. Yeah, we had COVID. COVID was tough, right? COVID was wild. I remember sh uh, sharing this uh, two weeks before the, uh, the, the shutdown and the pandemic and all that. We were actually in Disney World, which... Uh, looking back on it, probably wasn't super smart. Um, and, uh, and then all of a sudden the world closed. We get back from this great vacation, and then the world closed down. And it was crazy, right? <laughs> like it was nuts. No one knew what to do. No one knew what was wrong, what was happening. I mean, COVID was tough. Look, we, our family alone, we lost, we lost three uh, family members. I lost both of my grandmothers during that time. That was a hard year. My, 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 my wife, Kira, she lost her uncle. Like it was just, it was unexpected. We didn't know what was going on. We didn't know what was happening. No one could agree on anything. And of course, it wasn't just COVID, right? It wasn't like America was like, COVID's the only thing we got to worry about. No, of course it happened during an election year. Perfect. That's exactly what we needed. One more thing to argue about. We had that we had election year. There was all sort of, uh, all sort of racial tensions within, within the country. It was tough. But early on, uh, the, the, the actor John Krasinski, if you ever watch The Office, he's one of the actors there, he played Jim. John Krasinski makes this, this like YouTube channel called Some Good News. And within, like, he only had like eight episodes, but within like the first month, there's only maybe three, or, there's like three or four videos out of this point. He had 72 million uh, views in no time. Now granted, he's famous. Right? He's a famous actor. People know him. People know his wife. But what the, the purpose of these videos, in the middle of some really bad news, was to give us some good news. So he would highlight stories of like, you know, uh, kind and generous and benevolent things. Some good stories to make us go, oh, the world isn't just falling apart around us. There actually is some good around here. There's some good around here. And people were devastated when it ended because it didn't end like when the pandemic ended. It only went for like eight, eight episodes and they did a couple of little, little things after that. But the reason why that was so successful was because people were in the midst of some real bad news and they were looking for some good news. They needed something to cling on to. 
Because it's, it's, like, it's like normally in life, when you're in the midst of problems and challenges and circumstances, when everything looks bad around, if that's all you see and hear, it's hard to remember that beyond that is good things, positive things. We only see what's right in front of us, which is why some of y'all probably need to turn off the news. I'm just going to go and say that's a prophetic word for somebody in here. Because all you see is the bad stuff, the tough stuff, the suffering, the destruction. And you forget all of the things that are good that are out there. Well, that's a little bit of what we have here during this season. Advent. It's a, a, a word, that, it's a Latin word that means arrival, but really it's more than just arrival. It's about the, the, the hopeful expectation that you feel while you are waiting for an arrival. And where, what we do during this season is remind ourselves and, and harness ourselves in the time before Jesus when they were waiting for, the Jews, the Israelites, they were waiting for the Messiah to come. And they weren't just waiting for it to, for, you know, to, to, for a plane to land or, or whatever. We're, well, no, they were, they, there was answers. The Messiah was to do all of these incredible, amazing things. In the Old Testament, the reason why we look to Isaiah, we talked about this last week. There are what's called messianic prophecies, meaning prophecies about the Messiah, and they came to pass. And it wasn't just the incredible things that the Lord shared with prophets like Isaiah about how how the Messiah will arrive, like the being born of a virgin and and, and those sorts of miracles. Those were just signs. No, no, no. But what was the Messiah to do? He was to bring about the kingdom of God, restore the people of God, and heal all of the destruction that had happened. Last week, we talked about joy. In this season, man, December, look, it's so interesting. As a kid, growing up, December was so fun. I love everything coming up towards Christmas. Christmas is a blast. Love it. And then you become an adult, and then you got jobs. And you're like, man, you know what's really not fun to do during, uh, you know, December? Work. Not, not a blast, you know? Then you have, and you're married. And then you got to juggle, oh, whose family are we going to spend this with and that, you know, whatever. And then you get kids, which we know makes everything easier in your life. And you get kids. Now you got to juggle their, now you got to juggle their schedules. Then you got to, so now you have all these things that are complicated and it can, and, it, and then some people, December's a tough, tough season, especially if you're depending on your family background. Maybe you've lost someone around this time. When people, the grief just wells right back up and it makes, makes this time hard. But last week we talked about joy, that in this time we can experience joy because God gave us joy, something beyond happiness. We, can ha- we have access to the joy of the Lord and we get to choose it or not to choose it. And joy is yours despite your circumstances, despite what's going on around you. But today we're going to turn to hope. We're going to look at hope. Typically, like I said this last week, typically in, uh, in this season, hope is the first Sunday in Advent. But I, for, uh, I felt like last week was appropriate that we, we switched it around today. So, uh, we're, so today we're going to go to hope. Now, hope is a little bit different. Hope, uh, uh, when you think about the, that word, it can be a little bit confused with like the word optimism, where you know we can be optimistic that things are going to happen, right? But we don't actually know. We have a positive outlook. Being optimistic is a good thing. Being optimistic is not a bad thing. I'm not saying that. But sometimes we confuse hope with optimism. And, uh, but the, the problem is, we're going to see this later on, is optimism isn't based on anything. It's just a choice. It's smiling through the pain kind of a thing. But hope is something different. Now, the biblical, in the Bible, when it talks about hope, when it translates the word hope, there's a couple of different words in the Old Testament. The first one is uh, yakal. Now, yakal just means to wait, to wait for something. You know, like when you're in the doctor's office, you, you call that person to call your name, right? When you're a kid, you know, 
uh, you're, you're calling trying to graduate. <laughs> you're waiting for it. <laughs> Maybe hopefully you will graduate. You know, I don't know your situation. But then there's another word called kava. Now, kava is interesting, and they both can be translated as hope. But kava is a little bit different than just to wait for something. And here's why. Kava, the root word of kava in Hebrew is kav. And kav is the word for cord. So kava, was, it was, it's, a, it's an image to help us understand what is being meant when we say hope. Kava is like when you take a cord or a rope and you pull it really, really tight, really, really tight, really, really tense. And it's the moment that you're waiting for the rope to, or the cord to relax. It's giving us that image. You know, when you're, when you're hoping for something that you get that little gut feeling that your, your stomach kind of drops. You're like, oh man, oh man, oh man. I hope this happens. I hope this happens. And then it happens and you go, okay. It's the tension of, it's the tension we feel in the season of waiting. The, uh, the prophet Isaiah in, um, in Isaiah 28, he, he does this thing where he, he uh, gives this image of God as a farmer who kavaz for the grapes that he planted, right? So it's this image of God is plant, like a farmer plants something, right? And he doesn't just wait for the plant to, you know, the fruit to come out. He's like, I really hope this comes out and this looks okay and this, you know, it's edible grapes, right? Because that tension is brought about the knowledge and the experience that sometimes when you're waiting for something, it all it doesn't always come through, right? It doesn't always come through. But then in Isaiah 8, this is where you see it. He's, in Isaiah 8, 17, goes, I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope, I will kava in him. So Isaiah is writing this in a little context. Israel are a bunch of screw-ups. Every way, the Old Testament is just screw-up after screw-up after screw-up. And they really screwed up and disagreed, and, they, and, the, and the kingdom split. If you remember, if you're familiar, you have the, now you have the northern kingdom of Israel and the, and the kingdom of Judah. And you know from the Old Testament that people came through and, and, and destroyed their countries, took people hostage, and, and they were exiles out of their country. And it was all due to their unfaithfulness to Yahweh. To God. Their sin brought about that destruction. And so Isaiah, a prophet, what God does is he sends prophets, his messengers, in order to correct, to encourage, to, to uh, foretell of what God is, is doing or will do. And in this moment, I, I, Isaiah is, is showing us in, ver- in chapter 8, is he's, I'm waiting for the Lord to d- deliver us. So I will kava for him. I will wait for him. I will sit there with this tension in my belly, not knowing when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen, but I'm going to wait for him. Isaiah 64, where we read the beginning here, it's, it's Isaiah calling out for the salvation and the redemption of his people, saving them from their circumstances and redeeming them back to the people that they were always called to be. And in there, he says that there, he tells, he goes, there's no one like our God. So he's calling out to a God that is incomparable because of the situation that they need to be saved from and an identity that needs to be redeemed. And he believes that if he would wait on God, God will always deliver. And here's why. If you're taking notes, write this down. Our hope is built on the history of God's faithfulness. He's calling out these things of God because of what he knows about God. Isaiah 64, 3. Look at that verse. It says, when you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. When you did things that we didn't even look for, they didn't even necessarily ask for, God showed up. God shows up. In your life, God has shown up. 
And that's what Isaiah is doing right now. He goes, all hope seems to be lost, but my hope, what is true hope, is the waiting upon the Lord. Because I, my hope is built on the history of what God has done. And God has been good to us. He cried out, and, he, and I, for Isaiah, his hope wasn't baseless. His hope wasn't baseless. As Christians, it can look like we have this really strange version of, of hope. that we're, It's that, that dumb, idealistic, op, you know, optimist, being optimistic about something. But for us, we go, no, 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 no. We, we know who our God has been, what our God has done. And we're going to look to that. Now look at what, look at what happened. Isaiah, hundreds of years before Jesus, cries out to God, knowing that God's going to do his thing. He's going to deliver. And then he did something that God always does. He went beyond expectations, and he changed their paradigm about what was possible. They had an idea of who the Messiah would be. And then the Messiah shows up. And he goes, you think you need this, but let me show you this. Tim Mackey, who's an Old Testament Bible scholar, he, he, puts it, he puts it this way of what Jesus did. He says, he goes, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection was God's response to our slavery, to evil and death. We were enslaved to evil and death, our sin. It wrecks everything. The, the Israelite, the Jews, their king, it was, the sin wrecked everything. Relationally, it worked against each other, against themselves. The tribes, they, they broke up. You ever been through a bad breakup? Ever created a new country over it? Well, they did. It destroyed the protection that God had for them. When God said, well, if you're not going to be my people, then you can go and be Babylon's people. Because you are called to be my people, to be a blessing to the nations. And so it, Isaiah cries out for God to do something, and God shows up, and he sends his son. And Jesus comes around, and his life, and his death, and his resurrection becomes the new basis for our hope. Jesus becomes the hope. Jesus becomes the hope. Now, even look at, look at this. We were just in a, a, a series on 1 Peter. We're going to go back, 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the, Father and, uh, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. A living hope. Remember what happens when we, are, when we are born again, we are given a new life. And in that new life, we, are, we have been given the opportunity to be a different kind of human, a different form of humanity, one that isn't controlled by sin and death because we already know the way out of sin and death. Not that we, but we still have to live within this world that is ruled by the enemy that's what the Bible says. And so temptation's always going to be around. The opportunity for more death and destruction is always there. Yet, our hope is not one time when you were five years old and you went to VBS and you gave your heart to the Lord. No, 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 no. That hope transcends time and follows you everywhere. So you may have been saved 30 years ago, but today you are dealing with a really, really difficult situation. Maybe you're dealing with a really difficult sin, something that's plagued you. Maybe you're dealing, you have a hope that is, that is dynamic and is continued to live with you and present for you. The answer did not go away. The answer is alive within you. For those of us who are in Christ, it's here, it's now. And praise God, we don't have to look to ourselves for that hope. Jesus is the living hope. He gave us a new life. But it was through Jesus 
that now becomes the basis for our hope and trust in God because he's now part of our history. And we can look at the faithfulness of God when he sent his son, and we can apply that hope to us now. See, God does this thing where he just keeps on building on a foundation of his promises being fulfilled. And he keeps building on a history of of coming through and delivering and caring and loving and forgiving us. So wherever you are right now and you go, God, have you forgotten me? Have you forgotten God? Because God has not and has never forgotten. Look at the fact of all that God did leading up to bring us all here to this moment of worshiping together, gathering together. He's working all things for the good of those who love him. But here's the deal. Hope is a perspective. Hope is a perspective. Now I'm going to look here. We're going to go over. We're going to go over to the New Testament. We're going to look at this moment. But uh, after um, after Mary has been told that she's going to have be pregnant and have and have the Son of God. Verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. What a scary thing to happen. <laughs> Greetings, O favored one. I don't know, I wouldn't feel very favored. I'd feel like someone broke in and about to steal something. Verse 29, But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Now before we move on here, let's just try to sit with Mary's situation for a moment. How concerning and scary would that be? You're a young woman about to be about to get married. Talk about you already you've already got talk about just you know when it rains it snows. Lord, her life was full at that moment. Wedding planning, you know, the emotions of starting a new life, and then all of a sudden an angel appears and said, God is calling you to do something. And it's this. You have been looked on by with favor by God. And now he's given you this to do something with. That's scary. When God asks us to step out in faith, because he will. God will burden our heart with things, and we have a choice whether we're going to respond in faith or allow fear and a lack of trust to shape our actions. But moving on, it's verse 36, the angel tells her, Behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with, who, with her who has been barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it, be to, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. God gives supernatural promises with supernatural assurances. Look at what God did. Now we can, now look, the church from the beginning, has always admired Mary's, Mary's faith. We have. But look at what God did. He didn't just give her a supernatural promise. He gave her a supernatural assurance when he says, I know this sounds crazy, but you know your cousin Elizabeth, that girl's always also pregnant, and she's been barren, and you've known that she's been barren. So don't, don't discount, don't say that anything is impossible. No, nothing's impossible with God. The perspective got shifted. And her hope became something new. And a basis on a, sat on a foundation. She knew the history of what God has done for her people. Now she's getting a history, an immediate 
an immediate perspective shift of what he was doing for her cousin Elizabeth. God is asking us to step out sometimes in faith, but he's not asking you to do it blindly. He's saying, look around you at what I've already done and trust my provisions, trust the way that I carried you forward. Look also, look, remember in the, in the New Testament, it also says we gotta share our testimonies. The power of the testimony is we go, I see what God's done for them. I believe he can do that for me too. I see, what, I see how God moved in their life. And in that moment, I'm gonna trust that God's gonna move in my life. God gives us supernatural promises with supernatural insurances. He gave us a promise. He gave you and I a promise of salvation that our sins did not have the final say over our life. He gave us a promise that if we would follow him and obey him and walk in the ways of Jesus, we would allow Rabbi Jesus to, be, to disciple us, to be his disciple. When you make that choice, there is a purpose that nothing else in life can give you. There is no sense of peace and hope and joy that you can't find it anywhere else. That's a supernatural promise, but it's been supernaturally assured to us because I can promise you, you felt it at one moment. Or maybe you're new to this whole thing and you go, I need to see where God's done this other places. Number one, open up scripture and you'll see. Number two, get inside of the church and talk to the saints, those who have walked with God for a long time and walked with him faithfully. And you will see the way that God has assured that he will come through for you. What did we say last week? Our God's a promise keeper. He doesn't break his promises. Now he fulfills them in ways that you don't always expect. And that's a good thing. And he does it in a timing that we obviously do not want. Also a good thing. Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Not those who wait upon the Lord will pull their eyebrows out. That's a choice you make. Those who wait upon the Lord, hope in the Lord. Your perspective needs to be shifted on some things. Some of y'all feel pretty hopeless maybe during this season. And maybe you wouldn't even have, you walked in here, you wouldn't have described it like that. But after listening to this, you go, no, that probably is me. This feels hopeless. I don't know the answer to this. I don't know how we're going to get past this. I don't know how me and my wife are going to heal from this moment. I don't know how me and my family are going to be able to move past this. I don't know how God's going to help me give me the strength and the courage to be obedient and to work against the attacks of the enemy that is resulting in the sin in my life. Hope comes from a perspective built on the history of God that was further built on by Jesus. And that's a hope that's alive and active today. As the worship team starts to make their way up here, this is the last thing I wanna say. God wants to restore your hope. Now, here's the deal. I said, it's not, he wanted to restore your joy. He does want to restore your joy. But for some of y'all in here, he wants to restore your hope. We're going uh, to look at Romans 4, verse 17. I'm actually going to read the message version of this because I, I, I like how it says this here. So this is Paul writing to the Romans, and he's talking about Abraham. And I want us to see what he says about Abraham. If you remember, Abraham was the one that was, to be, that was the promise that his descendants would become the people of God and they would number that. Remember, he, but he and his wife were barren. So the fact that they even had kids was a miracle. It was a miracle within itself. And then it was even more of a miracle that God did what he said he would do. That his, his descendants would flow forth and, be, and, and populate the world and be, with the, the, would be the number of the stars, the grain, the sand, all, those, all these crazy things. And this is Paul's reflection on that. He says, we call Abraham father, not because he got God's attention by living like a saint, but because God made something out of Abraham when he was a nobody. How many of y'all can say God made something out of you when you were a nobody? Isn't that what we've always read in Scripture? God saying to Abraham, I set you up as a father of many peoples. And Abraham was first named father and then became a father 
because he dared to trust God to do what only God could do. Before he was physically a father, he was given the identity of a father. And that promise was a supernatural promise given by a God that gives supernatural assurances. Our God follows through on what he promises. And the promise, that only, only, what only God could do, the, the, the raise the dead to life with a word makes something out of nothing. Our God made all of the cosmos out of nothing. Don't you think he cares about your situation? Don't you think he's able to take care of what you're dealing with? Don't you think a God that has made himself known in his presence to us is going to be there with you and is present with you in your time of need and suffering and pain and confusion and chaos? And if not, let's see what else he says. When everything was hopeless, Abraham believed anyway, deciding to live not on the basis of what he saw he couldn't do, but on what God said he would do. The way God turns lives around, none of us could have planned it. For some of y'all, God has taken you so, you were so deep into the gutter, there is no one, probably yourself included, that had hope that things would turn around. Only God can do the impossible because there's nothing impossible for him. When everything was hopeless, this life, it has its moments where everything in front of you looks hopeless, it's defeating, but when you allow, to, when you allow yourself to have the lens of Jesus Christ, that perspective shifts and you go, I know who my God is. I know what he's done. And my hope isn't blind optimism. No, it's a hope built on supernatural assurances. It's a hope with the full knowledge of my own experience with the love of God in my life. It is not blind. It is informed. Because it may seem hopeless. Life may seem hopeless. But God will make a way when there is no way. God will turn around and do the impossible with you. Some of you feel a calling on your life that you go, God, there is no way that I can do that. Well, there's nothing impossible for him. So best believe he surely can fulfill what he's calling you to do. You are not called as a Christian to have this whole thing figured out. As a Christian, we're just called to obey through faith and to sit every moment fully in the full trust of a God who is trustworthy. We don't have to see that everything's gonna be okay. I don't need, the, I don't need physical evidence that everything's gonna be okay because I know that God will make all things okay. And understand when I'm saying that, that's not some health, wealth, and prosperity thing. Sometimes we believe in divine healing here. We absolutely believe in divine healing here. I also believe in divine unhealing here. And here's what I mean by that. I don't know why, but there are sometimes God doesn't heal. He doesn't. Sometimes it's because he wants you to walk out that road of healing Something, there's, there's something that needs to happen at the doctor's office. There's some sort of thing inside of you that you need to work on and trust in God. He doesn't just always snap his fingers, boom, you're healed. And the people he does heal, that's not the end of the road. It's just like when we talked in our generosity series, blessings are not the end. They are the means to an end that is determined by God. So those who do receive that healing, they have a responsibility to God because God wants to use that for some reason. 
Some of y'all are walking through roads, down roads that you go, I do not know why God will not change this path, this course. I do not know why God won't come through and make it all different and wipe the slate clean. Probably because you're called to sit in the uncertainty. Maybe he's trying to grow your faith and your own sense of trust. Maybe we have been spoiled with our lives that we don't understand what it means to walk in suffering. Maybe God wants to heal what you think needs should be healed, but that's not what God tries to heal. You think you're walking through a physical ailment and God's trying to use this moment to get you to deal with your brokenness from your childhood. Sometimes you need to see who you clearly are in a time of difficulty to know the areas of your life where you need more of God. Let me tell you, some of y'all know, and if you don't know, you know, here and I, we are one of our kids uh, as a special needs child, he has autism. Don't think I haven't questioned God many a times, why did you give me this? Why is this, why is this the burden of our life? Because it's hard. It's really, really difficult. You know, 90% of, uh, of marriages where there's a special needs child, 90% in a divorce. Here and I are in the 10%. It's hard. But let me tell you something, personally. The things that God has shown me when I'm at the end of my rope in my sadness and grief and brokenness are lessons that I could only learn through that. And for that, I am grateful. For that, I will say, you are a good God. You are a God who comes through. You're a God who hears my prayers. Now look, it doesn't mean that we don't, it doesn't mean we don't stop praying for, for Smith's or my son's healing. It's not any, any of that. But what God has shown me and done in me could only happen when I'm completely and totally broken. When chaos is all around me and I don't see the way out, that's where God shows up. Because just like joy, you already have hope. You already have hope through Jesus Christ. You've got to take it. You've got to take hold of it. I can't give it to you. I can't pray hope into existence <laughs> because you already have it. Just like joy. I can't pray you into joy. You already have it. You have to change your perspective and see what God has already given you. In this season, in this world, my war, oh man, this world is crazy. Our city, no offense to long time Panama City people, it's crazy. We have needs. We have needs. Our people are broken. Our people are hurting. They need the love of Christ to give them the true hope that only God can give. Let's stand across this place. want to recap here. Hope is a tension. It's a tension that we have experienced in waiting, but we don't wait aimlessly. We wait with the full knowledge that God always, always follows through on what he says he's, what he has promised us. And you do not need everything to be perfect to have hope. You just need to trust in God because Jesus Christ is a living hope. And if you have a problem with accepting what I'm saying, then you're going to have a real problem with 1 Peter 1.3 because it's a hope that's alive and active. I didn't give it to you. You didn't give it to yourself. Your mom and dad didn't give it to you. Jesus gave it to you. And it's there for you to take. It's there for you to walk in. God will restore your hope when you allow him to change your perspective. You want God to give you hope? then see things the way he wants you to see them. See the world, see people 
see your moment, your circumstances the way God wants you to see them with the lens of Jesus Christ. And when that happens, hope transforms waiting into this act of faith that builds things up. And so when you go up, they go, hey, how you doing? You know, the whole old adage is, you know, oh, brother, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. You know, I'm doing great. When the world's like crumbling around them, right? Sometimes we can actually say that. When everything is destroyed around us, we go, no, I'm, I'm blessed. God's good. God's good. I don't, mean that, I don't mean that I don't have some things I got to go deal with when I leave here and I get done shaking your hand. No, 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 no. It means God is good and has given me a hope that this moment may be the worst, but our God is the best. And he has restored and given something to me that I'm going to take hold of. Amen.